Hi everyone and welcome back to Tennis Time. In case you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do subscribe since I'm releasing weekly tennis content even during these times when tennis is not actively being played. So in today's video I'm going to talk to you about the pro tennis. Uh, pro tennis in a sense that doesn't really exist anymore since 1968 basically. So that's been 52 years ago. But if we think back prior to 1969, 1968, pro tennis has been a big deal and it's been a very important part of tennis history basically for 50 years prior to that. So the first pro matches were played back in 1928. What happened basically back then was that tennis has become an international sport Although it was not one of the most popular sports all over the world, uh, football for instance, I mean um, European football, soccer was pretty, um, pretty popular all over the world, but tennis was also starting to become a little bit better known. Um, an interesting phenomenon in tennis was that even if the sport wasn't that particularly well known and widespread, the stars were pretty important. So even in, in, the, in the women's game, if you think back that in, in 1920s there was Cezanne Langlaine and um, uh, uh, Helen Ritz Moody, how well respected and how great they were actually in what they were doing in the men's game. You had players like Bill Tilden, later you had Donald Budge, <coughs> Fred Perry, um, so the, these were actually the first people it was more going on on the men's side, so in, in the men's game it was these guys who turned pro first. So the first pro match was held in 1928, and basically two players, Karel Kozaru and Vincent Richards, were the first players to become pro. Bill Tilden was the next big shot who also turned pro winner of 10 Grand Slam uh, tournaments, Wimbledon and US Open champion back at the day. <clears throat> Basically what happened that uh, these players, these people were quite well known, they were stars, but they were not really making a lot of money. And a business idea from promoters came that, okay, we could use these stars, their names, so that they do something that is special. It's not like a regular tennis match or it's a regular tennis tournament. Um, they play against somebody else who is great and they turned to people who they were saying they were pros and then they went at it and they were playing basically a series. So back then, for instance in 1931 when Bill Tilden was playing Karel Kozalo in, um, in their first pro tour that, that meant that they were playing against each other basically. Um, from February to August and they played something like 60, 70 or 80 matches against each other. They were traveling to different places, different cities, different venues and they were playing against each other. And it was a series which in 1931 uh, Bill Tillman won 50 to 17 for instance. Uh, other great names along the years um, were quite big during those years in the 30s and the 40s came into, into pro tennis. Hans Nistlein from Germany for instance, uh, Elsworth Wines from the USA, the late great Fred Perry who was also a three-time Wimbledon champion and a Grand Slam winner. Then Don Budge, the first real Grand Slam champion from 1938. Um, in 1938, Donald Bunch has won the Australian, French, Wimbledon and US Championships, so he was the first to do it. He also turned pro. Um, then later on, Bobby Ricks, uh, who was, after the Second World War, probably one of the best, if not the best, American tennis player uh, of that era. He also turned pro. Then later on, Jack Kramer turned pro. Jack Kramer turning pro was a pivotal point um, in the story and history of pro tennis because he became one of the most important, if not the most important, promoter um, after he himself retired and he's one of the key contributors who managed to bring the game ahead and 
they turned pro and they made tennis become open. So other players later on, like Tony Trebert, Frank Sedgman, uh, Ken Rosewell, Pancho Gonzalez, Lou Hoad, Ashley Cooper, Mel Anderson, Pancho Segura, Andres Jimeno, uh, Butch Buckholz, Barry McKay, uh, Luis Ayala, uh, Rod Laver. So all these guys uh, along the years have turned pro. And uh, at some point, it started to be even strong in the 50s, in the late 50s and early 60s, that there were more and more people uh, going pro. And uh, it was a little bit of a downfall for these, for, for these guys not to be able to compete at Wimbledon at the US Championships, the greatest events in tennis. So... The main motivator for them turning pro was to earn more money because with the current setup they had in place back then there was not a lot of money uh, in store for these players so they felt okay we have to we have to do something about it and incidentally um, creating a pro tour and bringing on a parallel tour in the in the world of tennis that was their solution on the other hand, as I said, over the years they felt like, okay, this is a, um, a very tough decision to be made because they're never going to be allowed back to Wimbledon. They're not going to play at Wimbledon. They're not going to play at the French Open or the US Open. So it was a big sacrifice for them. And uh, even though they had to make the big sacrifices, ultimately it seems that it paid off. Um, but until then they had to go through some uh, very rough conditions. For instance, take a listen to what uh, Butch Buckles had to say about uh, the rough conditions back in the day. I played 29 matches in 31 days. I slept in 30 different beds. And there is another crazy story what Tony Trailer is telling us about linesmen in the pro matches, pro tour matches. I was playing a match against Ponch Gonzalez and he served the ball this wide and I take a peek to see who the line person is, and it's a woman in a fur coat. He served another ball in the alley like that. No call. So I turned to her and I said, you're not going to call that good, are you? She said, well, I'm not calling the serves. She thought she was calling a ball once it was in play. He could have shanked one up in the seats and gotten credit for it, you know? We had things like that in Italy. Guys during his cappuccino missed a call. So since the... The players had to travel quite a lot and they were driving from one city to the other, from one day to the other. It was always a little bit difficult for them to know when the courts are going to be ready and when will they be able to practice. And Butch Buckles again is telling us a little bit about that. The big issue was when would the court get down? When could we practice? And the other thing is, today we have professional people that are calling lines. We used to get linesmen coming out of the stands. Max, let's listen to a funny story. Rod Labour is telling us um, how it was for him for the first time to become a pro. One time we were driving up to Utica, Ithaca and Albany. And this is in the middle of winter, January. And Barry McKay's driving, and we get up there, and we're slipping and sliding. And as we're so sliding down sideways, Barry McKay turned around, and he says, "Welcome to pro tennis." <laughs> Being a professional tennis player at the day was not a pleasant thing. They were doing a lot more money, but from the amateur organizations committees, from the ITF at the time. They were really ostracized and they were made like the bad guys who just sold themselves and went uh, someplace else or somewhere else just to earn more money. And that was not something um, these guys particularly enjoyed. It was very difficult for them to get a general acceptance all over in the tennis world because the amateur organizational bodies were trying everything in their powers to make the pros look bad. They, of course, did not want to lose their own business in the amateur world. One of the things uh, was spread around was that these matches were not really competitive, that they were just sort of exhibition matches. 
and take a listen to what Donny Trebel had to say about that. And people thought as we toured that, that we were playing exhibitions. I, I can guarantee there weren't exhibitions. <laughs> we were trying to win like crazy. Another thing that was sad, which was a little bit scandalous at the time, that these matches were fixed. And of course, the pros were saying, no, then these matches were definitely not fixed. And if you look at some of these matches uh, back in the day, you have to agree with that, that uh, the, these guys were really fighting and putting heart and soul into, into these matches. So take a listen to what uh, Ken Roswell had to say about it. We were pretty upset. You know, I think a lot of people took that view that a lot of the matches were fixed just to, to please the audience type of thing. It didn't happen as far as I was concerned. There was also another story which we're going to listen to uh, just now. Story told by Butch Buckles again. Uh, what happened during a match when Rosa was playing Pancho Gonzalez and Rosa received a telegram uh, while he was playing the match that his mother passed away. Do you remember Ken Rosewall playing Pancho Gonzalez? Wally Dill walks in and hands him a telegram. Reads it, sticks it in his racket cover, went out and beat Gonzalez. Um, Wally Dill tells us that, that the telegram was that his mom had just passed away. So as you can see, for these guys, it was really important that what they've done, what they were doing at the time was, was taken seriously and they've put heart and soul into these competitions and to these matches. But certainly as Ken Roswell is also telling us right now, it was very important for these players to get financial security. I didn't really enjoy that much being away from home, uh, but I knew I had to do that uh, to, to make my, my future life a little bit more financially secure. That was the first attempt in 1960 to make tennis open, and Jack Kramer was one of the biggest promoters of that. So let's take a listen to what he had to say about it back in 1960. We were trying to convince the amateur officials that they should agree to open tennis. And that meant that amateurs and pros could play in, in the same event. We all frankly believe that the Davis Cup should be open to all players. And we are frankly looking forward to the day when it will be open to all players. It very much looked like that uh, tennis is going to open, uh, to be open from 1960, but the vote just did not come through. Apparently some people on the committee who were committed at the beginning to vote for open tennis changed their minds or whatever, and it didn't happen. So these were really disappointing times, and Jack Kramer was looked at at the time as the bad boy, who, the bad promoter who is destroying tennis and creating havoc all the time. And after this 1960 vote going wrong, pro tennis did seem to have lost something. And they felt like they had to do something special to keep pro tennis alive and thriving. And what they've done was to recruit the 1962 Grand Slam champion. Grand Slam champion Rod Laver, he was the first one to win the Grand Slam uh, after Don Bunch back in 1938. So this was a big deal, the Grand Slam champion, the Davis Cup champion, coming into the pro world. And the amateurs and the amateurs were saying back then that, uh, yeah, the pros are not particularly that good as they appear to be. So this was a big deal for the pros recruiting Labour. And they really wanted to make sure that they are going to beat even Labour. And this was a really big thing at the time. Lou Hope was the first one to play Labour and Labour turned pro in late 1962. And the match was taking place at the beginning of 1963. And Lou Hope did beat Labour pretty convincingly in four sets. Let's take a listen to what Labour had to say about that. They beat up on me pretty well when I first turned pro. Playing amateur tennis, you know you're playing somebody that you can beat most of the time. And so you're playing pretty relaxed. But then when you're struggling for points in the pro ranks, you know, it, it, 
the whole thing just flips flips over, and yeah, yeah, you're you're a you're a mess. So trying to control your emotions out there is is not easy to do when you've got four or five thousand people there. So it was a learning experience. So as years went by, uh, pro tennis has become stronger and stronger, and. Um, the discussion was picked up again. Let's take a listen to what Jack Kramer again had to say about the potential open tennis and then what Norman Strange, uh, back then the Australian uh, Tennis Federation president, had to say about it. We, of course, hope that it won't be too long when, for the good of both amateur and professional tennis, that the officials who have the control a see fit to pass the open tennis question affirmatively and then we hope that the association of professionals and amateurs can get together with a program designed to exploit and promote tennis a game not just professionals or amateurs we hope we'll all be on the same team because we consider that professional tennis would kill amateur tennis if both were mixed together in time professionals would take over and the amateurs would be placed into the background it would be detrimental to the small tennis nations if the professionals uh, came into the amateur game. And there would be arguments over divisions of profits. And the game would develop into outright commercialism. So in 1967, something spectacular happened in the world overall and in tennis as well. For the first time, so 53 years ago in 1967, Wimbledon was broadcasted in colour for the first time. The man who was running Wimbledon in 1967 was Herman David. And he was discussing with BBC at the time about the fact that Herman David was claiming to have the greatest tennis tournament in the world. But BBC was saying, no wait, there's still a bunch of pros are the best players in the world and you're not having these guys in your tournaments so what's going on and this made Herman David think quite hard and he figured in August 1967 to put the three-day tournament together uh, they've uh, asked the top eight pros to come in and play a tournament and Herman David was saying if you guys are going to fill all the crowds for the, third, for the three days coming then you're going to be invite, invited back to come back in 1968 and play at Wimbledon, no matter what the ITF says. So that was a very strong catalyst of the day. And yes, the crowds were really full. And by that time, Rod Laver has climbed some tough mountains and he was at the peak of his powers and he started to dominate the pro game. And he won that event, uh, incidentally, against Ken Roswell in the final in 1967. So shortly after that, all the major championships went open. The French Open, Wimbledon and the US Open were played already uh, open in 1968. And in 1969, the Australian Open went open as well. So this is basically, in short, the brief history of pro tennis. So some people talk about the fact that if we consider the major pro championships that were played back in the day, those should also count as Grand Slams in a way, because the competition was really very strong. So these pros were basically the best players in the world. So that's like taking Djokovic, uh, Nadal, Roger Federer, Andy Murray, um, maybe Stan Pavrinka, Juan Martin del Potro and they would form a tour of their own and they would battle each other day in and day out uh, every week, every month and they would have their own tour. So if these players would be playing against each other constantly then definitely this would be the creme de la creme championship of all time. Uh, so that's how we have to think a little bit about the pro tour. But but even if, if we think about it like that, it's but it's really tough to, to decide, okay, should we really think about it like that? Is Roosevelt, Pancho Gonzalez winning one of these events really equivalent to Grand Slam? It's really tough to say, but even if, it's really tough to say, but 
I, I don't think we really have to decide on that. But if we take a look at pro tennis and uh, who's played in it and how much they've won, you really have to think of, uh, of Ken Rosewell, who was doing incredibly well. He has the most uh, uh, pro titles. So he, he has won the most uh, pro slam titles. He's at 15. Uh, he's played 19 finals. Uh, Pancho Gonzalez winning uh, 14 major titles. Rod Laver winning 8. So of course there is a, there is a difference between um, how many, for how many years Laver played the pro, the pro Tour and for how many, how many years um, Roswell has played the Pro Tour. Roswell is 4 years older than uh, Rod Laver. But if you would combine the classic slams that Ken Rosewell has won with the ones he's won, won as a pro, then you would go up to a number of 23. Roger Federer has 20 titles, Rafa Nadal has 19 titles. If you would combine what Leiva has won as a pro and what he's won as uh, um, amateur, amateur player and then later open era player, he's also at 19. So that makes you think a little bit also of Ken Rosewell and how how big his influence was and how good he was and how 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 incredible his longevity was. It goes even beyond what Roger Federer has done to date. Take a listen to what Bud Collins, John Barrett and Steve Fink had to say about the longevity of Ken Rosewell. You know, you could make an argument that Rosewell was the greatest player of all time because he was still winning titles in his 40s. There is no player ever who has had the longevity that he had. His first Wimbledon final, for example, was 1954 and his last was 74. And he won the US championships 14 years apart, 1956 and 1970. To be in the finals of the two biggest tournaments as he was in 74, losing both to Connors when he's 39 years old, speaks for itself. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up, please. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And yeah, check out my different content that I have on the GOAT and the greatest matches of all time. Thanks a lot for tuning in and see you next time.